it was only after I had my implant that the telephone suddenly became part of my life. It's the most incredible feeling, I can tell you. And it's something that I thought would never, ever happen to me. Welcome to this episode of Hearing Health Today. I'm your host, Craig Sharp. In today's episode, we will continue our discussion on progressive hearing loss and what happens when hearing aids are no longer enough. On the last episode, we spoke with Professor Ulrich Hoppe to get the perspective of a hearing health professional. In this episode, and as part two of our segment, we'll get the perspective from a patient, Malcolm, a retired business owner and cochlear implant recipient in the UK, who struggled with hearing aids for many years before finally receiving a referral for a CI. This is a podcast for hearing health professionals. If you are a person with hearing loss or a member of the general public, please seek advice from your health professional about treatments for hearing loss. So Malcolm, uh, thanks for joining us on uh, this episode of Hearing Health Today. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Before we kick off with some of the questions about hearing loss and your experience with hearing aids and cochlear implants, I wanted to learn just a little bit more about you. So could you tell us who Malcolm is? Uh, where do you live? What do you do for a living? I actually retired uh, about four weeks before the shutdown over here. For the last 21 years, I've been running my own business. And before that, I had um, a long career in the city of London. I've been deaf most of my life. Did you rely on hearing aids primarily before receiving your cochlear implants? About a year before I had my implants, I actually lost all of my hearing. So I had really no hearing left. Being in the position of finding out about an implant and whether it would help me at that time was the only option I had left. Prior to that time, I was 95% deaf the majority of my life. When were you diagnosed with hearing loss? And how did that ultimately lead you to different avenues to try and treat your hearing loss? Well, my journey really started when I was two years old. When I was that age, uh, I had uh, measles very, very badly. Hmm. And it left me deaf in my left ear. When I was seven, uh, I lost the hearing in my other ear. For no apparent reason. But I can still remember it happening because it was like somebody had turned off a tap yeah. and it just vanished, just like that. That was back in the um, middle 1950s. They had just announced a new wonder drug called penicillin. Okay. And they took me into hospital for two weeks and gave me massive injections of penicillin four times a day in the hope that it would uh, do something to to help my deafness. And it didn't make any difference except to make me feel very ill, really. <laughs> so I had my first hearing aid when I was seven. And that was, at that time, the very first uh, National Health Hearing Aid, which was a very massive contraption with enormous batteries attached to it. So I remember having to um, have specially strengthened pockets in my trousers to hold the weight of it all the time. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Really going back a long way, that is. My parents at the time felt quite sorry for me, so they managed to find a, a, a privately made hearing aid that fitted in the shirt pocket, and that kept me going very well for a few years. But it was quite a long time before behind the ear hearing aids came out that was powerful enough for my hearing loss. How old were you when the behind the ear hearing aid came out? Let me see. I mean... Remembering back all those years, I mean, when I was seven, what really happened was that the shock of going deaf actually made me go dumb. Because I actually lost my speech. And my parents were referred to a special teacher of the deaf who worked with deaf children. And she managed to get my speech back. She was a very, very forward-looking person in those days because the normal thing when you went deaf all those years ago was that all children had to go to a deaf school. And my teacher was very much against that because she felt that deaf children should have the right to mix with ordinary hearing people all the time. 
So she and my parents had an enormous fight at the time with the education authorities to get me into a Moonhean school. I think that because I was the very first to be allowed into a normal hearing school. It took a little while for the wheels to turn and for other children to join. I think it took quite a few years before it became a normal thing for deaf children to go to a normal hearing school. By the time I was in my secondary education, I think it was pretty normal for deaf children to go to normal schools. It was a slow process, but it did happen. So at that point, I guess you would have had hearing aids. Were you able to hear uh, well in both in grammar school and at university? Yes, I think, uh, as I remember it, I was always sitting in the front of the class to be near as possible to the teacher. I think that was the only thing that was a consistent thing that happened. The real challenge came when I was at college because going to lectures was difficult in the sense that uh, I could either spend my time listening to the lecturer and lip reading what they were saying. I couldn't write down notes at the same time. You couldn't do both things simultaneously. And when I was at college, I had um, a group of close friends that we became very friendly with. And I used to attend the lectures and concentrate on listening to what the lecturer had to say. And then afterwards, my friends would lend me their notes so I could make my own notes from theirs. I effectively did twice as much work as they did, really, to get to the same position. But it worked out very well, and um, we all ended up getting a really good degree from there. And what did you do for the City of London? What I did, I worked for a company that produced um, financial information on stock exchange companies. And I worked for them for, oh, easily 20 years. I became their chief financial analyst. Awesome. Pretty well in control of um, the type of information that was sent out. The fact that I was deaf uh, was not a problem there because it was not a role that really needed the telephone to be used. It wasn't a customer focused role, it was uh, a backroom role. Uh, after 20 years there, I was eventually made redundant moved to another company, and after five years there, I started getting a little bit frustrated because the company had been taken over three times in five years, and it had lost its direction, and we were sort of working very hard and not really getting anywhere. So I, I was approaching the age of 50, and I decided my 50th birthday present would be to start my own company. Oh, wow. And I actually did that. So life began for me at 50. And I started a company that was involved in um, sign making and um, graphics design. I was initially part of a franchise, but after five years, I came out of a franchise and literally ran the company myself. And back in those days, that was, believe it or not, when email was just beginning to take off. So I found email as a very useful business tool. And we sort of trained our customers to email me as much as possible. Did you not use the telephone then for the first uh, 50 years of your life, including when you actually started your own company? Our deafness was really so bad that it was impossible for me to understand anything on the telephone. I could never hear anything on the radio. I could only watch television if the program had subtitles included. Otherwise, I would never follow anything at all. So it was only after I had my implant that the telephone suddenly became part of my life. So what's that like to not use a telephone for 50 years and then all of a sudden it's a possibility one day? It's the most incredible feeling, I can tell you. I have a son and he was the very first person I ever telephoned. I mean, all these years I've been really, really jealous of other people who 
can phone up their family whenever they want and keep in touch with people very easily. And it's something that I thought would never ever happen to me. So when I had my implants, I couldn't use the telephone immediately. I had to go through that process of learning all these new sounds that I've never heard before. Yeah. It was a few months down the line before I felt confident enough to try and telephone my son. And the first time I did it, I reckon I understood a good 70, 80% of what he said without any problem. And the second time I phoned him, from that point on, was I was able to get every single word he said. Wow. And it's absolutely amazing. How often do you use the phone today? Um, I'm slowly using it. Well, I should be using it a little bit more than I do. I regularly phone my son. I need to practice phoning other people because I find that it usually takes a few goes to get completely familiar with a new person. One question I have for you, uh, was it your audiologist that suggested that you got a cochlear implant or how did you decide to look into cochlear implants as a possibility for you? When I originally went deaf when I was seven and they didn't really know why I went deaf, they simply told me that it was something to do with the nerves in the head. They assumed that something had gone wrong with them, but they didn't really know, they were guessing. So all these years, I've sort of assumed that I went there because there was something wrong with the nerves in my head. So when cochlear uh, implants first came out, I didn't really pay very much attention to it because I didn't really think it would work with me. But because I was so busy in my life and getting on fairly well with the hearing aids, I didn't really consider having an implant at all. And it was only when we happened to move to our prison house five years ago, six years ago now, that I changed my medical authority from the previous one to the one in the area in which we lived. And the hearing department there invited me down because I was new. And they were the first people to say to me, we think you should uh, apply for an implant because you can easily qualify. And at that time, the local hospital, St. George's Hospital in Tooting, was relatively new to doing implants. And they were looking for customers, in effect. And that made me start thinking about whether it would be worth looking into, because as the audiologist said to me at the time, it doesn't hurt to ask and you go through your various tests to assess whether you would uh, be suitable. And you can find out more about this as you go along. But about six months after that, I was finding my hearing maybe getting a little bit worse. And I was starting to look into whether there was a hearing aid that was even better than the one I had. And we had a company come down to talk to me about hearing aids. When I woke up the following morning after all this, I found I'd lost pretty well all my hearing overnight. Oh, wow. So although I was 95% deaf the day before, the following day I first found I was only able to hear a tiny amount from what was effectively the lowest note. I discovered later that I only had 3% of hearing left in the very lowest notes of sound. Wow. So it was a very, very weird sound and it made my life very, very difficult. So the only option for me was to really look into being assessed for cochlear implants because I could see no other solution to give me any hearing back. Yeah. I went to see my doctor and she immediately went to the hospital to get me involved in the assessment. But it took the best part of a year before I actually had the implant itself done. Could you describe the moment when you first had your cochlear implant switched on? What was that like? Yeah, that's something that um, I will never, ever forget. You see, because all the people I met on my journey during that year 
Well, Ulrein is very confident that the implant would work for me. But they didn't really say how well it could work. So when I had the switch on, the audiologist said to me that they would play a hearing test with all the notes from low to high and to let her know which ones I could hear. And I didn't expect to hear just about every single one, which I did. Oh, wow. Back to leave fell off my chair. <laughs> so I think deep down, I was sort of expecting to get the same, the limited range of sounds that I had before. I was hoping that that would come back. I didn't expect to get the full range of sounds, including all these sounds that I hadn't heard since before the age of seven. Uh, that's incredible. I can't tell you how surprised I was. And then how did your hearing progress, I guess, from the moment you were switched on in the months and years that followed? It was a real adventure, actually, because when we came back from the hospital after having the switch on, the first thing you naturally do is go in the kitchen and make a cup of tea. And I must admit, the sound of putting a tea cup on a saucer was so incredibly loud, it was unbelievable. <laughs> I was so focused on trying to learn all these new sounds and trying... It's amazing how the brain works in terms of learning what should be a background sound and what is a more important sound. And it seemed to be working all the time in the background to improve the hearing I was having. So I remember one day we were driving in my car up to visit some families up in Norfolk. And my wife put on the radio to listen to the traffic report. And it was followed by a news item. And I remember I was driving at about 70 miles an hour on the motorway and this news item came on. And for the first time I actually heard every single word that was wow. being spoken on the radio. And I remember thinking to myself, that was very interesting. You know, I heard every word of that. And then suddenly I realised what I'd done. And it was a good thing there was no cars near me because I had a bit of a wobble. <laughs> going back the <laughs> yeah. and it's been a little journey because where I am now, I can actually listen to audio books. I've started listening to one or two, and I'm getting on pretty well with those. And I'm listening to the radio gradually more and more as time goes by. And uh, it gives me goose pimples every time, because it's things that I've never been able to do before. Can I ask you, why uh, did you not look into cochlear implants earlier? Or what, what held you back from looking at cochlear implants before you did? Well, I think... Looking back, I should have done that. I think at the time, I was simply so busy in my life, it didn't really occur to me that there was anything better out there compared with the hearing aid. I was simply unaware that it would work for me and would be as good as it is. For our listeners whose patients and clients might be in the same situation you were a few years ago, where hearing aids are no longer enough, what would you say to them? I think I would certainly advise anybody who is struggling with hearing aids to look into an implant, most definitely. I think it's far, far better than a hearing aid could ever be. And um, you mentioned the phone previously, but I'm curious, what are some of the biggest life changes you've experienced with a cochlear implant? Just about everything, really. <laughs> It's transformed my life in every way you can think of. Even simply walking down the street, hearing the birds sing in the treetops, I mean, that's completely new. So many new sounds, so many things I'm aware of now that I was never aware of before. I could almost write a book, I suppose, and all the new things that I've been hearing that are completely new to me. I think one of the most important is basically... When my switch on was done, it was literally five days before Christmas that year. And at Christmas, we meet up with our family. And 
that was the first time that I actually realised that every single person talks in a different way and it's possible to recognise a person's speech instantly by the sound of their voice. Because before then, everybody sounded pretty much the same to me. All I was aware of beforehand was that boys tend to have deeper voices than girls. And that was about it. If I was in a group meeting with my hearing aid, I would always have trouble identifying who was speaking at the time. And then if yeah. somebody else in the group started speaking, you'd, you'd have to find out who was speaking. And you'd always miss some of the conversation in the effort to try and keep up with all the talking that was going on. That first Christmas, being able to identify everybody by voice and instantly know who was talking was such a huge change. It was absolutely gobsmacking. Yeah, that's incredible. It's, uh, it's very much sort of learning to live again with something completely new, and it's amazing. It really is good. I think at the moment I'm still learning to get the maximum benefit out of this implant. I'm still learning sounds. The future is much more of an open book now than it was a few years ago because I really intend to make maximum use of my hearing and go out there and enjoy things much more than I could ever imagine before. Put it this way, life for me now is so much different to what I thought it was going to be a few years ago. On the one hand, the volume of what I hear compared with the hearing aid is so much greater. Add on to that the range of sounds. Now that I've got the whole range of sounds and not just a few little notes, means the quality of what I hear is so much better and so much clearer. So it's so much easier to talk to everybody. I think that the, since the switch on, it's been a very, very interesting journey where I've been learning to use my newfound skills slowly, but more effectively all the time. And it's been amazing in the sense that my brain seems to have this ability to learn new sounds in the background without me realising it. Once I was about two years into the journey, I discovered that my brain was actually telling me what the sound was and where it was coming from in a way that never used to happen. When I was deaf, if a sound happened, I could never tell which direction it came from. I was always the last person on earth that you would ask where the sound came from. But now, if something unusual sound happens, I know instinctively where it comes from, and I go straight to it. Oh, that's great. It's amazing to be able to actually do something as simple as that. I've really got to get across the message that having an implant really is not something anybody should worry about, because the end results can be so amazing. There's no way in the world that anybody, given the choice, would choose a hearing aid over an implant if they knew how good it was. You're a testament to that, Malcolm. So incredible what you accomplished with hearing aids, but even more impressive sort of how your life has changed with a cochlear implant. I'm still sort of um, in a state of disbelief, really, that the way life has changed so much for me, really. Once you got the cochlear implants, how did that impact your business? It made my communication with my staff so much more easy. Uh, it made it much easier for me to um, talk to my customers personally when I saw them. If I'd had that level of hearing when I started my business all those years ago, I'm sure my business journey would have been a lot easier. Now I'm completely retired, you can bet your boots that I'm going to enjoy all these sounds as much as I can. <laughs> well, uh, you definitely should, and best of luck in retirement. I, I'm, I'm jealous. Malcolm, thanks again for joining us on this episode of the podcast. Your story is incredibly inspirational. 
and it was a real pleasure talking with you today. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure meeting you and talking to you as well. All the very best. And thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you enjoyed it, please make sure you press the subscribe button and give us a rating and a review. If there's a particular topic you'd like us to cover, please mention it in your review. We'd love to hear from you. You can find all the links to what was discussed in today's podcast in the description and stay tuned for our next episode. In the meantime, stay safe. Just a quick reminder, the views of the interviewees in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of Cochlear Limited or its subsidiaries. This material is intended for health professionals. If you are a person with hearing loss or a member of the general public, please seek advice from your health professional about treatments for hearing loss. Outcomes may vary and your health professional will advise about the factors which could affect your outcome.